In the 1924 collection of Meister Eckhart's writings, Professor C. Evans writes this in his introduction. Eckhart has been called the father of the German mystics and the philosophical creative genius of the German mystics. According to Dean Inga, Eckhart is next to Plotinus the greatest philosopher mystic and the most Platinian of all Christian philosophers. He was a learned member of the Dominican or preaching order, and it was at the Dominican College of St. Jacob that he was given the title Meister by Pope Boniface VIII. But it was principally at Strasbourg and afterwards at Cologne that he established his great influence as a teacher and for an entire generation with the boldest freedom preached to the multitudes in the German tongue on topics bristling with difficulties for the Orthodox faith. For he had conceived the then novel idea of instructing the laity and the many semi-religious communities and brotherhoods of that day. Eckhart's success at expounding the abstruse tenets of the scholastic philosophy in an undeveloped language, which he had to supply with words and fashion to his needs, earned him the titles of father of the German language and father of German philosophic prose. The church authorities became alarmed at the enthusiasm roused by his teaching and especially at the effect on the laity. He was accused of preaching to the people in their own language things that might lead to heresy. This led to his excommunication in 1329 after his death on the general grounds of preaching to the laity the secrets of the church, a list of 17 specific heretical and 11 objectionable doctrines being appended to the indictment. A sermon entitled The Poor in Spirit by Meister Eckhart Based on Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The beatitude opened its mouth of wisdom and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Angels and saints and everything that has ever been born must all keep silent when the eternal wisdom of the Father speaks. For the wisdom of the angels and all the creatures is a mere nothing compared with the wisdom of God, which is unfathomable. This wisdom has declared that the poor are blessed. There are two kinds of poverty. One is outward poverty, and this is good and much to be commended in the one who makes a voluntary practice for it for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. But there is another poverty, an interior poverty, to which our Lord is referring when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, or poor in spirit. And if you wish to understand my argument, I urge you now to seek this poverty of spirit. For by the eternal truth, I assure you that unless you are like this truth we speak of, it is not possible for you to follow me. Several people have asked me what poverty is. We will now try to give an answer. Bishop Alberta says, quote, By a poor man is meant one who is not satisfied with anything God ever made, end quote. And this is well said. Better still, taking poverty in a higher sense, we say that a poor man is one who wills nothing, knows nothing, and has nothing. It is on these three points that I propose to speak. In the first place, a poor man wills nothing. Some people misunderstand the meaning of this. Those, for example, who win personal repute by penances and outward disciplines, God have mercy on them, they are highly regarded though they know so little of God's truth. To all outward appearances they are holy, but they are fools within and are ignorant of divine reality. These people define a poor man as one who wills nothing, explaining this to mean that he never follows his own will at all, but is bent on carrying out the will of God. In this he is not bad. His intention is good, and we commend him for it. God keep that man in mercy. But in my opinion, such people are not poor men, nor are they, they the least like them. They are much admired by those who know better, but I maintain they are fools with no understanding of God's truth. Perhaps heaven is theirs because they mean well, but they have no concept of the poverty about which we are talking. 
If someone were to ask me what then is a poor man who wills nothing, I should answer like this. As long as it can be said of a man that it is in his will, that it is his will to do the will of God, that man has not the poverty that I am speaking of because he has a will to satisfy the will of God, which is not as it should be. If he is genuinely poor, a man is as free from his created will as he was when he was not. I tell you by the eternal truth, as long as you possess the will to do the will of God and have the least desire for eternity in God, you are not really poor. The poor man wills nothing, knows nothing, wants nothing. While I was still in my first cause, I had no God, and I was my own. I willed not, I wanted not, for I was conditionless being, the knower of myself in the divine truth. Then I wanted myself, and wanted nothing else. What I willed, I was, and what I was, I willed. I was free from God in all things. But when I escaped from my free will to take on my created nature, then I got me a God. For before creatures were, God was not God. He was that he was. When creatures became and started creaturehood, God was not God in himself, but he was God in creatures. Now, we contend that God as God is not the final goal of his creatures, nor is their final goal the very great riches which the least creature has in God. If a flea had intellect and could intellectually plumb the eternal abyss of God's being out of which it came, then so we maintain God, and all God is could not fulfill and satisfy that flea. Therefore we pray that we may be rid of God and gain the truth and enjoy eternity. For the highest angel and the, and the soul are all the same in that place where I was and willed that I was, and was that I willed. And so, a man may, may be poor of will, willing and desiring as little as he willed, and wanted when he was not. And in this way, a man who wills nothing is poor. Secondly, a poor man is a man who knows nothing. We have sometimes laid it down that a man ought to live as though he did not live, whether for himself or truth or God. But now we declare that a person in this poverty has got all he was when he did not live in any way, not for himself, nor for truth, nor for God. He is so liberated, so free of any kind of knowledge, that no idea of God is alive in him. For when man stood in the eternal species, God, nothing else lived in him. What lived there was himself. And so we say that this man is as free from his own knowledge as he was when he was not. He lets God work as God wills, while he himself remains as idle as when he came from God. Now the question is, where does happiness lie most of all? Some masters say it lies in love, others that it lies in knowledge and in love, and these come near to the mark. We contend that happiness lies neither in knowledge nor in love. In the soul there is one thing from which both knowledge and love flow, but which, unlike the faculties of the soul, itself neither knows nor loves. Whoever knows this knows the seat of happiness. This has no before nor after, nor does it accept anything to come, for it can neither gain nor lose. It lacks it is lacking, in the sense that in itself it knows nothing about working. It just is itself, enjoying itself God fashion. And, then, and in this sense, I say man ought to be idle and free, entirely unknowing, unaware of what God is doing in him. That is the way to be poor. According to the masters, God is being intellectual being which knows all things. But I say God is not being, nor yet intellect. He is not someone who knows this or that. God is free from
from all things, and he is all things. Being poor in spirit means being poor of all particular knowledge, like one who does not know anything, not God, nor creatures, nor himself. Here there is no question of a man desiring to know or recognize the way of God. This is how a man is poor in knowledge of himself. Thirdly, the poor man has nothing. It has often been said that perfection means not having mortal, earthly things. Maybe this is true in one particular case, that is, when it is voluntary. But this is not the sense in which I mean it. I have already said that the poor man is not the man who wants to do the will of God, but the man who lives in such a way that he is free from his own will and from the will of God, even as he was free when he was not. This is the deepest kind of poverty. Second, we say that a poor man is a man who has no knowledge of God's work in him. To be as free of knowing and perceiving as God is of all things is the barest poverty. But the third poverty, the most stringent, is having nothing. Here I would remind you that I have often said, and eminent authorities have also said, that if one would be a fitting place for God to work in, one must be devoid of things and of activities, both inwardly and outwardly. Now we are saying something else. Granted that a man is bare of everything, of creatures, of himself, of God, yet if it is still in him to provide God with the room to work in, then we affirm that as long as this is the case, then the man is not poor with the strictest poverty. It is not God's purpose that man should possess the place in which God does his work. Poverty of spirit means freedom from God and all his works, so that if God chooses to work in the soul, he must be his own workshop, as he likes to be. When he finds a man who is so poor, then God is his own patient and his own operating room, since God is in himself the operation. Here is the penury. Man is obeying his eternal nature, that he has been and that he is now and that he shall ever be. There is the question of those words of St. Paul, quote, By the grace of God I am what I am, from 1 Corinthians 15.10. Here the argument soars above grace, above understanding, and above desire. The answer is that St. Paul's words are true that grace was not in him. The grace of God worked in him, perfecting him to unity, and then the work of grace was done. Grace having done its work, Paul remained as he was. He was a man too poor to have to or be a place for God to work in. To preserve a place is to preserve a distinction. The reason why I pray to God to rid me of God is because conditionless being is above God and above distinction. It was there that I was myself. There I willed myself and knew myself to make this man. And in this sense, I am my own cause, both of my nature which is eternal and of my nature which is temporal. For this I am born, and as for my eternal birth, I can never die. In my eternal mode of birth I have always been, am now, and shall eternally remain. What I am in time will die and come to nothing, for it is of the day and passes with the day. In my birth all things were born, and I was the cause of my own self and all things. If I had willed it, it I would never have been, nor would anything. And if I had not been, then God would not have been either. It is not necessary to understand this. One learned doctor says that his breaking through is nobler than his emanation, that is, his flowing out of God. When I flowed out of God, then all things said, quote, There is a God. End quote. Nevertheless, this cannot make me blessed for in it I acknowledge that I am a creature. But in my breaking through then, standing passive in the will of God, 
free of the will of God and all his works and also of God himself. I transcend all creatures and am neither God nor creature. I am that I was, and that I shall remain now and forever. Then I receive an impulse which carries me above all angels. In this impulse I apprehend such surpassing riches that I am not content with God as being God, as being all his godly works. For in this breaking through, I find that God and I are both the same. Then I am what I was. I neither wax nor wane, for I am the motionless cause that is moving all things. Now, God can find no place in man, for by his poverty man has got that which he has been eternally and will remain forever. Here in the Spirit of God is one. That is the strictest poverty a man can know. If anyone is unable to follow this discourse, he should not put his mind to it. While he is not like this truth, he will not see my argument, for it is the naked truth straight from the heart of God. May we so live that we experience it eternally. So help us God. Amen.